Good evening, everybody. My name is Trent J. Baldiff, and I will be presenting here with you all today. But first, before we get into the presentation, I would like to say a quick thank you to our sponsors, because without them, none of this would be possible. And don't get me wrong, uh, the great hospitality of Window World is greatly appreciated. Also, the Small Business Association of Ohio, thank you all. Eastern Gateway Community College, you all are awesome. Youngstown Score and Youngstown Foundation, you folks, amazing, thank you. And then last but most certainly not least would be Westminster College in Pennsylvania. Without these folks, without these organizations collaborating, communicating with one another, I would not be standing here today to help deliver some hopefully enlightening information to you, the listener. So today, what are we gonna be talking about? It's uh, an array of things really, but we're gonna do our best to keep it focused and on track with bees and biomimicry on how we can build not only the ecosystem, but the economy at large, both personal economy and the economy. A little bit about myself as an entrepreneur and what I do as a beekeeper and an environmentalist. The history of my career as an entrepreneur goes back into 2017, which albeit I was about 21 years of age at that time. Just discover, just get my feet wet, just really getting my grasp on how the world might be working and what I might be able to do to help out and be a part of this functioning society. And I have almost my entire life since I was a teenager been an environmentalist and been concerned with how us humans interact with the earth, whether it be the fact that we are polluting our oceans with litter or the effect that we are emitting tons and tons of carbon into the sky all at once. What struck me to, what in, let me put it this way, what inspired me to move forward as an environmentalist on my entrepreneurial journey was my past in wastewater treatment. And to make a very long and intrinsic story short, my work as a wastewater treatment operator exposed me to the idea of becoming a beekeeper and being a beekeeper. And from then, from the very moment that I conceived, you know, I could be a beekeeper, the race was on. And this was July of 2017. And so here you see a photo of me leaning up next to my, one of my beehives and hoping and praying that they don't sting me in Cleveland, Ohio, in the Slavic village of Cleveland, Ohio. And to the right, you can see my two logos. So the top logo is Tees Bees LLC. And what we do is we provide pollination services to urban and organic farms. We sell beekeeping equipment to fellow beekeepers. And then we're also unveiling some specialty honeys, one of which is infused with hemp extracts. So it's, uh, it's known as a CBD or a hemp honey. And then the other we're gonna be infusing with mushroom extracts. And for those of you who are aware, there are medicinal mushrooms like lion's mane, and things of that nature, we're gonna be infusing our honey with reishi and chaga, which have their own certain health benefits. And down below that Tease Bees logo there is the Have a Hive logo. Have a Hive is a nationally recognized, not-for-profit trademarked program where individuals and organizations can sponsor beehives. The idea behind it for me was, I know that people are willing to sponsor starving children in Africa and abused animals. There are not enough opportunities for people to indirectly support these bees and be a part of the solution because everybody since I would say 2014 has heard the saying, save the bees. But yet and there was not, in, in my opinion at least at that time and still to, to this day, there's not enough of an effort in terms of bringing awareness and solution to helping actually save the bees. With, with Have a Hive being a sponsorship program, the individuals can, or organizations can sponsor beehives, beekeepers, or hive parks. And what's cool is that we have an app that connects the sponsor to that beehive, that beekeeper, or that hive park, and in some cases, all three. And because of that app, we've been kind of compared to like the Uber for beekeepers and the Airbnb for beehives because these sponsored beehives can go anywhere and be maintained by local beekeepers. And that 
application links that sponsor and that beekeeper and that beehive all together, making it seem not so frightening. Bees are more friendly than most people think. And I think that the, the purpose behind the app was not only so that the sponsor could actually see where their money is going, but so that the beekeeper had more opportunities to do what they love to do in their local community. And so that the, again, the user, the sponsor, the, the app user would have a better idea of what's actually going on in those dresser drawer looking boxes, like those weird things that you might see on the side of the road sometimes if you live in the country. And Have a Hive has so much more to their mission than just providing a sponsorship opportunity. What we are looking to do is redevelop and, how do I say, build up upon existing urban green spaces or completely redeveloping these urban green spaces or urban plots into green spaces so that they're more sustainable, so that they can provide food to the hungry, education to the youth, and opportunities for occupational development to not only veterans, but anybody else within the community that might be down on hard times. A hive park, which I had mentioned in the beginning, remember people can sponsor beehives, beekeepers are a hive park. A hive park is essentially a combination between urban agriculture and urban apiculture, AKA urban beekeeping. And as I'd mentioned before, we seek to be able to feed people, not only with food, but with knowledge also, and the opportunity to develop themselves as a professional. And with that, we have multiple organizations that we've partnered with. And as much as I would love to go down the rabbit hole of who all we're partnered with and why and how this works together and how we're community organizers and developers, let's save that for the Q&A because I want to roll right into the, the meat and bones of the presentation. Why do we need to save the bees? Why is that saying so prevalent since 2014? And most people know, some people do not. Some people live in somewhat of a state of panic and fear because of this, but if you do not know, life without bees and other pollinators is you without life. Life without bees is you without life. And you want to, you wonder to yourself, how can these little insects seriously have such an impact on the way that we live our lives? It does not, it's almost unconceivable if you're not out on the front lines, I'm talking about myself like I'm some sort of soldier, but if you're not out on the front lines like other beekeepers or a beekeeper, actually witnessing these pollinators visiting the flowers and watching life as we know it blossom and bloom and fruit, without bees, none of that's possible. And again, there's other important insects out there such as butterflies and even flies and ladybugs, they're all great too but I'm a bee guy, so we're gonna focus on bees. And I am quite serious when I say that life without bees is you without life. We would really not have a whole lot to hang our hat on in the end of the day if it weren't for these insects. In fact, one quarter of all wild bee species are endangered. Bumblebees, carpenter bees, some of the hornets, yellow jackets, although nobody likes the hornets or yellow jackets and some of the other bees that you find, I get it. They're scary. They can sting you and they're not particularly the most attractive things. Trust me, I know there's a bad stigma about them, but we need them. We genuinely need them. And the fact that one quarter of all wild bee species are endangered should be concerning and alarming to not only yourself, but your future generations that are to come. I know that I'm worried about my grandkids' ability to harvest and have healthy, wholesome food in their garden, hopefully they garden, because of the fact that one quarter of all the wild bee species are endangered. Not only are one quarter of all the endangered or species of wild bees endangered, you gotta take into consideration too that over 90%, nine out of 10, over nine out of 10, flowering plant species, 90% of the 370,000 flowering plant species depend, depend on insect pollination. So what does that mean? Your fruits, most of your vegetables, gone off the table. We will only be able to eat things like soybeans and corn and grain and wheat. And don't get me wrong, they can be mass produced. That's great. They're wind pollinated, cool, even easier. They're not that nutritious for you. They're just not in comparison to the nutrient, nutrient 
value that you find in some of the fruits and vegetables that come from these flowering plants. And again, if you look to the top right of the presentation slide here, that is, you can easily take out half of that entire plate because they need, they need pollinated by insects. 35% of all crop production is made possible by bees. That is an insane amount of food. You got to think of it. If we are producing, just let's, for the sake of conversation, if we're producing 100 pounds of food a year, 35 pounds of that is just gone out the door. I wouldn't even want to know how much we're actually growing and losing because would be losing if bees went. Pfft. That's scary to think about, genuinely scary to think about. We would all starve, quite frankly, or we'd be eating crappy cereal for the rest of our life if we got lucky. I don't want to do that. I love my avocados and peaches and pineapples and <laughs> green peppers. These things are so necessary for us to have a well-balanced, well-rounded diet of complete sustenance. And without bees, we just simply don't have any of those options. And to further emphasize the point here, without bees, our economy tanks. I mean, there are billions of dollars in agriculture produced every year. And of those billions of dollars in agriculture, you can cut out 35% of that easily. One of every three bites of food that we take is responsible to a pollinator such as a bee. That is unreal. We need these bees and without them, not only do we starve, but our economy tanks. Our environment is gonna become a bland cesspool. There will be no flowers in excess. There will be no real color. Everything would be really kind of drab and ugh. And that's why I put the, the puking turd on fire there in the, in the corner. That's what life would be like to me if we didn't have bees and if we didn't have these beautiful fruiting plants. And I mean, think of never being able to have pineapple again. I mean, I, you might not be a fan of pineapple, but that makes me almost shed a tear thinking of that. But what can we do about this? What can we possibly do to conserve the environment? Let's just start with that. What can we do to conserve the environment? If we break the word down, conserve the environment, what can we do to interact with the environment, our ecosystem, Mother Earth, what have you? How can we better serve and conserve our environment? The answer to that to me is biomimicry. Biomimicry is simply, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're taking the processes and the way Mother Earth does things and we're mimicking that. We are mimicking our biology, our life from what is already being done. Our human minds tend to think too much sometimes and we get ourselves into trouble. And sometimes we don't think enough and we start to pollute and we start to overuse materials that we really don't own in the first place. We just take and take and take from Mother Earth. Well, at some point there is a tip and we won't be able to take any more of this resource and that's gonna affect the economy. Part of my proposition, because in the very first, word of the definition of biomim or the words of bio the definition of biomimicry is the design and production of materials. Whatever we design and produce, if we're taking minerals, if we're taking resources from the earth, we should be doing so in a moderated way that doesn't feed into a capitalistic, egotistic society. Albeit there may be a huge demand for all of these materials, but at the same time, we can't outpace nature. That's just not fair to Mother Earth and ourselves. We will actually stub our toe, fall flat on our face in the long run if we do not start to be a little bit more conscious as a collective. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a ton of companies, it's like, like Amazon has a pledge to remove billions of pounds of carbon out of the air by year 2020X. At the same time, there's not a collective concern, a collective effort, and by all means, I'm putting that responsibility on us. I'm not going to be looking to the government to help us with that. I'm not going to be looking to these massive corporations to help with that. It's going to be a collective voice of the individuals on the 
outskirts that actually makes the impact of we should not be treating the earth this way. Here's a proposed different method. Let's do things to replenish the resources as quickly as we take them. That makes sense. Keep everything at an even keel, because like I said, there will be a tipping point and there's no returning from that tipping point. We're quickly approaching that. Not only does it apply to the production of materials, but it also, per, per, it also pertains to the idea of the fact that we are mass producing omniculture, meaning there are 100 acres of one crop. There is so much to be learned and implemented about biodiversity. You have healthier soils, healthier fruiting plants, native plants, and they, that not only feeds into local food systems, but it also feeds into local wildlife. We look at biomimicry and I think biodiversity. I also think of mimicking Mother Earth. And when it comes to the design of production, design and production of materials, we have to also think not only replenishing those materials, but we have to think Mother Earth does not typically just have one set of species, one species in that 100 acres worth of land. You know, you look at maybe there's 100 acres full of one type of tree, but if you look in the soil, there's different types of mycelium, there's different, which are mushrooms, there's different types of fungus, there's different types of moss, there's different plant life growing up underneath all of the trees. And what's really cool concept about trees, listen to this crazy talk, kind of ideological, a little bit abstract, but the idea of it is this, the tallest trees, the ones that can reach up closest to the light, take in all of that light through photosynthesis and channel all of that energy that they're getting down into the root system. And as you can imagine, all of those roots between those trees that are two feet apart, but a hundred foot tall, those roots are touching. They're not only feeding energy into themselves and sharing like we ought to be doing, but they're also helping new life sprout up at the same time. Don't get me wrong, folks. I think that there's a lot of good sharing and I think that there's a lot of potential that is being expressed to help the next generation come up. I think it needs to be even more of a focus of ours if we want to really be able to uh, advance society and save ourselves from potential ruin. In the next couple bit of sentences and words from the definition of biomimicry, I have systems highlighted there. And I think that you can see that. When it comes down to it, how we do what we do is most important. Why we do it is grand. Why we do it is what motivates people. This is what extracts emotion out of people. But how we do it, is it ethical environmentally? Is it ethical for human beings? Is it a way that we can not only construct something, but construct each other while it doing it? And the systems is what I would like to focus on for this next slide, because when it comes to biomimicry, it's extraordinarily important to mimic great systems. We don't want to try and rebuild a wheel that's made of a square block, clunk, 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 clunk. We want things to tick right along and find its own path of least resistance, so to speak. And in my time as a beekeeper, an environmentalist, an entrepreneur, I, the first time I ever visited a beehive, I opened that lid up and it was just like, I, was, I felt like I was in space. It was incredible to see all of these, like thousands and thousands of insects all crawling around one another. Not only that, the fact that once you expose them to the light, they collectively, and I mean like every single bee in that hive, started to vibrate at a different rate frequency. They went, mm -hmm. they all knew within a half a second of that lid being open that, yo, somebody's here. And that's when I put the smoke on them and put them at ease, which fun fact, most people wonder what the smoker is for. We'll get off track for just a little bit. We'll come right back. The smoker actually, when the bees pick up on the pheromones of that smoke, right? They're like, this hive is on fire and immediately start to gorge themselves on whatever honey supply that they can in case they all decide to collectively leave. If the hive were actually on fire, they would collectively leave. Little do they know the person in the white suit up above is 
checking on them, making sure that they're producing enough eggs, making sure they're bringing in enough sustenance. All the while, they're distracted because they think that their hive is on fire from that smoke. Back to the original topic, first time I opened up that beehive, I got to tell you, it was an incredible sight. It was an incredible sound. And the aroma was just something like out of a, I don't I, it's difficult to describe other than saying that it was earthy and feminine. You've got to think that there's propolis, beeswax, honey, insect poop, and pollen all coming out of that hive. And because they're flapping their wings, it's like a big draft of air coming up through out of the top of that hive. And it was just like mind-blowing how amazing that smelled. The smell is something that I'll never forget and I hold true and near, to, near and dear to my heart. Not necessarily why I'm talking about beehives being the perfect society. You've got to think of this. How can you get 10,000 stinging insects working together as one single organism? I think that there is something to be learned from that. There is something about the biology of that system to be mimicked. You see, I believe that human beings can improve upon the way that we do things if we began to think like a bee, if we began to act more like bees. And part of what I'm trying to say is that it would benefit us to have a hive mind. Bees not only have like a caste system in their hive, but it's an instinctual caste system. When a female bee, a worker bee is born, their job immediately, they just know it's time for me to clean the hive. You know, they take care of the grunt work, so to speak. Then as time goes on, you know, the, the lifespan of a worker bee is close to two to three months. As they get older, they will graduate, so to speak, instinctually to becoming a nurse bee. And what the nurse bee does is they take care of the sick and the injured, they feed the baby bees, they tend to the queen, and as their life, like right at the tail end of their life, that's when they become foragers. They put their badge on, they get to fly outside, they get to go visit flowers, get nectar, gather pollen, and bring back all of these resources to the hive itself. There is something to be said about that. The queen has one job, lay the eggs, and keep the direct the entire colony. They follow her based on her pheromones and her frequency. The worker bees communicate with one another by dancing. They all are communicating through frequency. And then the drone bees, they don't really, the male bees, they don't really do much. They just really help impregnate the queen and eat honey. They're kind of slugs. I don't mean to be bashing my fellow kind, but at the same time, they're kind of slugs. Anyhow, what I'm getting to is the idea that everybody throughout their life evolves into the position that they're meant to be at. They are supposed to, at first, be willing to serve anybody and everybody by doing the humble tasks such as cleaning. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that when, you know, when your child is born, make them scrub your toilets. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that I know from my personal experience scrubbing toilets, working on a farm and scooping poop and being a wastewater treatment operator and things of that nature. I don't know why they were all poop related. Don't ask me that. But at the same time, that kind of mentality of I'm here to serve. And it doesn't matter to me if, I, if you need medical care. It doesn't need, matter to me if you need a ride to the anywhere. If you need help, I'm here to serve. I'm not above you or below you. We're right there at the same time, at the same token. I think everybody could it could benefit from that type of a mentality. And having a hive mind is, like I said, playing your part, developing into your role, your chosen role in some cases, if you're lucky, which I think we're all meant to be a creator in our life. You can write the story. I, I love the saying, and I believe it was uh, Les Brown that said that in life, you are the canvas, the paintbrush, the painter, and the paint create it. Your life is supposed to be a work of art. And in order for you to play your part, you have to know and ask, how may I serve? What can I do to make this world around me a better place? And that is thinking like a bee. When you ask yourself, how can I help my neighbor? How can I 
make this world a better place, not only for the fact of the matter that I'm going to be happier doing it, but I'm able to serve better because I am happier. I am well within myself. Therefore, I spread wellness amongst my fellow bees in this case. You have to play your part. You also have to take responsibility to serve impersonally. And impersonal service, <laughs> like immediately what comes to my mind is nurses. These folks, men and women both, are just incredible people. I've never met a nurse that was uh, an a-hole, pardon my French. But what I'm saying is that these people are there for you. They wait on you hand and foot while in your, when you're in your time of most need. Because as I like to sit, think and know that the real wealth of life is your health. What's a million dollars if you can't even get up to walk around and go around the, the park bench or to a park bench and enjoy feeding pigeons? What what is <laughs> what is money if you can't go out and enjoy yourself? You don't need money to go and enjoy yourself, but you need your health to go and enjoy yourself, your mental, your spiritual, and your physical health. Those are all three very important things. But you have to take the responsibility to serve them personally because of the fact that. It doesn't matter if you are white, if you are black, if you're a woman, if you are a man, or if you are anywhere in between any of those spectrums, brown, doesn't matter your nationality, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, we are all in this together. And the imagined delusion of separation that we put upon ourselves because of different races and backgrounds and geographical locations and upbringings, like what, what does that have to do with anything about us getting together and getting along. For whatever reason, our ego has always gotten in the way of allowing us to really come together as a society and one world and unite and move forward together. If you serve impersonally, you set aside your personal, maybe upbringing, maybe your personal beliefs, you set aside all of these factors that could hinder you from actually being of wholesome service to these people. When you serve him personally, you present yourself as is with love, open and accepting arms and mind to whoever it is that needs help. I'm here to help you. Now, don't get me wrong. At the same time that you need to be able to serve him personally, in life, it's a very delicate dance to be wisely selfish, knowing when to say no and who to say no to. Because as you all know, we can be enabled. We can be enabling, we can be used and abused, we can be jacked around just because somebody's taking advantage of us. It's important to be wisely selfish. And that goes right along with serving impersonally, because the more that you serve impersonally, the wiser you get to, okay, my time is important and best spent here. My resources are best accumulated and put together here. Learn how to serve him personally so that you know your true gifts and how to appropriate, that's the right word, your time. Another thing about having a hive mind is you have to have faith in your neighbor. You've got to think, what if everybody in the world was consciously trying to become the best version of themselves? I would like to think that everybody is, whether they know it or not. Sadly, sometimes I see things and that's just not the case. And that's okay. You have to have faith in your neighbor that they are on their path to righteousness. They are on their path to becoming a better version of themselves. And that is hard to believe sometimes because you see people addicted to heroin. You see people just angry and not happy. At the same time, one of these days, sooner than later, maybe in the next lifetime, doesn't matter. It's not up to you, but they are going to have an enlightening time where they are, huh, it's important for me to improve myself. It's important for me to become a better version of myself. Why though? Why is it important for you to be a better version of yourself? So that you can serve better. All of life is service to others through love, with the intention of growing love, with the intention of gathering people together for the cause of working together in life just like bees do and it is literally just like bees do that's all that their one goal is those ten thousand stinging insects are just thinking one thing survive 
And I think we humans are a bit evolved beyond, hey, we, we need shelter and food. You know, we're, we're a bit beyond that. So what can we actually do now that we have our base solidified, most of us? And, you know, I thank God every day that that base is solidified for myself. I hope you also have that for yourself. It's up to the people that are standing on a solid base that accumulate these skills and develop themselves to reach down and pick the people up to help them get their base settled. It is so important for you to develop yourself because then you become somebody that is an example for other people to live, live by. Not only that, you are more fulfilled. You have a more of a peace of mind knowing that you're becoming that version of yourself that you once conjured in your mind, you once thought of. And it's amazing as an entrepreneur, I can speak for this personally. It is amazing to see the process of taking thoughts to things. And you are the greatest investment you could ever make. So why not think of yourself as healthy, wealthy, loving, kind, and be able to grow into that position of being healthy, wealthy, loving, and kind exponentially. Every single day, your journey, I suggest, I think, whatever that, take it with a grain of salt. I think that it's so important for people to continuously improve on themselves. How can I be better than yesterday? How may I serve? Because I believe that when you ask questions like that, God, the universe, answer them. They give you inspired thoughts and actions of how you can serve. They help you find your gifts within. Another way and one of the most important things that somebody could do to not only help improve themselves but to have a hive mind is to see life in a different light and i specifically put this here because of the fact that bees see in uv they don't see in the same wavelengths of light that us humans do bees see flowers they see all different colors than we do and they actually don't have ears they strictly communicate through frequency and you know the, the metaphysicist in me is saying that well light is frequency frequency is light when you see life in a different light you i hope it's a brighter light let's put it that way something that allows you to see wow I need to bring more love to this situation. This situation is one that needs love. This situation is one that needs patience. This situation is one that needs more empathy and compassion. When you see life in a different light, you are being empathetic towards that person that you are looking at. And in a way, if you really think about it, and I believe thoroughly, everybody that we come across and everything that we do is simply a reflection of what's going on in here in our hearts. As so within, so without. So when you ever come up across the situation where you're frustrated or angry and you just don't know what to do, try and see it from a different light because it might just be the universe or God telling you there's a solution that you're not seeing because you're not being patient enough. You're not, being, you're not calming your mind enough. You're not opening your heart enough. See life in a different light by opening your mind and your heart at the same time. Grasp everything that you can with these open arms because... In the end of the day, when you cower back in fear, nothing happens. You stay stagnant and you stay uncomfortable. It, there might be a sick, toxic sense of comfort in that, but when you really open up your arms and say, I am here, use me as your vessel, Lord. I am here for uh, my neighbors. How may I serve? You're able to see that different light. That's why they call it enlightenment. Now that we know and have a very good idea of how we can improve the environment through biomimicry. My suggestion is that we take all of those concepts, having a hive mind and being kinder to Mother Earth, to grow our businesses. Not only as entrepreneurs, but grow the economy as a whole. Because when you grow your personal economy, you bleed out into everything else that's going on. And so, how can we grow the economy? entrepreneurship. Hands down, the most incredible journey that I've ever gone on. It developed my public speaking. It developed my ability to network and relate with people. Entrepreneurship has forced me 
to step up on every single level of my life, mentally, physically, socially, sexually, spiritually, financially, everything. And with that being said, entrepreneurship, not only for the people that own businesses and the people that aspire to own businesses, but everybody need to know the definition. Entrepreneurship is the process of creating a new enterprise and burying any of its risks with the view of making the profit. How does that apply to us? The creating an enterprise and burying any of its risks. That Those red words right there, to me, just scream, hey, don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. There's a different version of you on the other side of that. There are new, fun, friendly people on the other side of that. For me, a personal example was a time in my life where, you know, I had an addiction to marijuana and I just could not fathom being sober. I just could not. It was not only a medicine, but a crutch for me, an unhealthy, toxic crutch that had been affecting my family life, my relationships, my wallet, all of these things. It, it fuzzied my relationship with the higher power that I worship. And if I were not willing to bear the risk of seeing what it looks like on the other side of that fuzz, that haze, I would not be able to create a new enterprise of myself. It's like Jay-Z said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. Everybody's got their own personal economy that they need to tend to. And that leads me to my next slide here. The idea that life doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your aspirations are, life is an entrepreneurial journey. And because of the definition that we just heard, creating an enterprise, you have to think of yourself as an enterprise. I, albeit, that's a very objective point of view, meaning there's no feelings involved with that. We're looking at ourselves as almost like a brick and mortar store. Not the point. Our life is an entrepreneurial journey because of the fact that we create ourselves. We craft our life the five things that lead to people creating their life and making any sort of change in their life is their intentions, their actions, their thoughts, their words, and their emotions. There are five things that can help bring about any sort of change into your life. As an entrepreneur, as a family member, it's your intentions, your thoughts, your words, your emotions, brain fart. That's embarrassing. Your intentions, thoughts, words, emotions, and actions. Sorry about that, folks. But life really is an entrepreneurial journey. And if you take those five principles, those five um, methods of action, you can ultimately begin manifesting some great things for yourself, whether that be waking up earlier in the morning, drinking more water, eating a healthier food, because it all starts with thought but how you carry out that thought process and how you begin to implement that into your daily life matters greatly because it's not only a reflection of you being willing to step outside of that comfort zone and bear any potential risks to create your enterprise, but it also represents that you are willing to be galvanized is the word that I wanna use, but that's just like pertaining to metal. You know, iron sharpens iron. And if you're out there willing to step outside of your comfort zone and work on yourself and continuously create a better version of yourself, you're going to meet people that are doing the same thing. As so within, so without. And there is no such thing as opposites attract. It's like attracts like in this universe. And there's no reason for you to not want to be happy. And I think that building yourself is a, is a path to fulfillment. When you are continuously working on yourself, you build your confidence, you build a routine, which is easy for you to just stick to. You build new habits, ways of thinking. And I don't know about you, but I'm a big believer that what you think you create, what you say you are, and what you become through those thoughts and those words, you act out. It's important to continuously develop yourself as an entrepreneur, not only in business, but in life itself, because your life Creating yourself is the path, is a path to fulfillment. It's not the only path to fulfillment, but it's a path to fulfillment. 
And so with that, I want to provide you with four different things that you can work on creating every single day. You can create a lifestyle for yourself. Some people are just fine and dandy and happy being a couch potato. And that's the lifestyle that they like. Not personally for me, but it is one way that those lifestyles that you choose to interact with and create for yourself is going to be a big part of your fulfillment and what makes sense for you. Your network is also a way for you to be and continue, is also a way for you to be fulfilled and continue your growth. Your network is your net worth. Who you associate with, you are most likely to mimic. When you hang out with five clowns, who do you think is going to be the sixth clown? Yeah, they'll have a fun little honky nose, but a clown, you know, they serve their purpose. Don't get me wrong. But if you hang out with, say, five millionaires, who do you think is going to be the sixth one? You pick up on the patterns of the, those in your environment. So network with the right people. Hang out with, the, and those lifestyle and network go right hand in hand. You, those who you network with ought to have a similar lifestyle to what you're trying to emulate. And one other way that you can create yourself and build yourself for the path of the fulfillment and enlightenment that we're all going on as entrepreneurs, both in life and in business, is how do you want to serve? Create your service. That's the fun part about being an entrepreneur is deciding, I see a problem. I have an idea of a solution. Let's see if it works. That's the science of life. Really getting to understand and know how well your proposed idea fits into the lifestyle of somebody else, how it fits into solving that problem. That's important. If we didn't have people willing to create services, we would not have America or the world as we know it. Without entrepreneurship, without entrepreneurs, we would not have life as we know. It. We'd all be basic third world countries and maybe even still walking around with clubs in our hands and going and hunting and gathering. Nothing wrong with that life back in the day, but we're a little bit more advanced now. Create the way that you serve because you were brought here with gifts and you can only give your entire life away. There's no such thing as a trailer hitched to a hearse. You can't take anything with you when you go. So you might as well serve others while serving yourself. You continuously build yourself up so that you can serve others better. You are more apt. You increase your aptitude for service and your attitude about your service. Last, but most certainly, not least, is you have to create love. Love for yourself, love for your neighbor, love for your service, love for your lifestyle. If you don't love your life, I feel bad. There has to be something of deeply intrinsically entwined with you that is calling for more love, is calling for more satisfaction and fulfillment. And the best way to create a loving life for yourself, one that creates love internally, because as so within, so without, when you're creating love internally, you're going to be able to share that with others, whether that be through inspiration, interaction, acting out intentions, whatever it may be, you have to focus and be willing to step outside of that, like create the enterprise and step outside and, and bear any risks to create that life that you think you may love. And with that being said, as you're creating the life that you love, as you're creating, period, don't expect a straight line. Don't expect A to B because there's a to B to C to D. And just very similar to what I have posted in the picture of that graph going up, it's gradually going up, but there are dips. There are times when your lifestyle is going to be so monotonous to you that you're just going to want to take a break from it. There's going to be parts of your life where you are desperately trying to get somebody in or out of your network because they don't benefit you or you believe they will benefit you. Your service is not always going to make sense to you and you're not always going to have love within you. But here's the catch all. We're humans. We are imperfect as all get out. We have egos. Spell ego. E-G-O. We edge God out. We don't take the time to really understand and see life in a different light 24 seven. And that's okay. Expect divots in your path, expect downfalls, but always strive for the ride back up. Always be working on yourself and your environment and both your, and your network. Always be looking to come on the way up. 
see what you can do to improve yourself. As a man of faith, I like to close with two, two of my favorite Bible verses. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. What does that say to you? We, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, to me, that means we're all in this together. We may be of the flesh, but beyond that flesh is the spirit. And that spirit is ever pervading. That spirit touches each corner of the universe. That spirit is consciousness. It is energy. It is emotion. It is love and, and working love, too. We all share that. Doesn't matter what religion you come from, the color of your skin, the geographic background, we are all here in spirit. Another verse and chapter and Bible verse that I enjoy is Mark 9, 35. Whoever wants to be first must place himself last of all and be the servant of all. If you really want to claim your stake in this world, again, which is impermanent, you have to understand that it's all about service. We're all walking each other home. Uh, I discovered my personal purpose in life on May 4th, 2018. It was the day that I was My entrepreneurial journey had begun, and I had a job for myself coming out of college, but I really thought to myself, like, what am I going to do? Like, what's the point of me doing all this? Why, why am I going to go, like, work my tail off? Is it just for personal enlightenment? Is it just for personal development so that I can have some freedoms and have fun during my life? And that still small voice within me said, our purpose in our path to enlightenment is to help others enlighten themselves to their relationship with their higher power. Whether that be Jesus, whether that be communion with Buddha, whether that be talking with Hare Krishna, or any of the other prophets and gods that are, may or may not be praised. We are all in this together. And it's important to serve everybody selflessly. If we truly want to build a better environment for ourselves, we're going to look more with more concern to how Mother Nature does what she does, as well as how we can help her, how we can keep a balance and equilibrium in the environment. And part of the best way to become um, a vigilante for the environment and Mother Earth is to think like a bee. It's important to have a hive mind and for you to trust your neighbor, know how you want to serve, and be there When it comes to thinking like a bee to help with the environment, thinking like a bee to help with the environment, being an entrepreneur, both in business and in personal life. When you become an entrepreneur and you are that entrepreneur, you are creating your life with the purpose and intention of building yourself up to help others come up as well. We're never in this alone. All in this together, united through love. If we want to build up the environment and the economy, we have to be entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs think like these. I'll open it up for any folks that may have any There are no questions, okay, thank you. which is fine. I won't hold it against y'all. I'd like to just provide a quick thank you again to our sponsors, Window World, Eastern Gateway Community College, Youngstown Score, Youngstown Foundation, and oh my goodness, the Small Business Administration of Small Business Administration of Ohio and the Westminster College in Pennsylvania. And with that, here's my contact information. It won't click. Oh, there it is. 
here's my contact information for any folks that you know if you were maybe too shy to think about uh, think of a question at the time please feel free to call me that is my cell phone number That's and that is my nice. email i check both of them daily multiple times and i would be seriously obliged to talk to you about your life your business or any of the ideas that i discussed here in this speech and with that i love you all thank you for your time go uh, go forth and be well thank you <laughs>